Well, welcome, everybody, to another edition of Lewis at Large. Here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck. And, of course, some smart talk radio uh, is certainly in your future. And uh, this segment, uh, very excited uh, to have a very special guy with us, uh, retired Army Sergeant Major, author and speaker Matthew R. Drayton. Uh, He has written an extraordinary work called Succeeding While Black, A Blueprint for Success. Uh, He grew up uh, or was born in Savannah, Georgia, uh, in an underprivileged neighborhood. He joined the military to leave that environment and become financially independent, uh, which led to a decorated 26 years uh, in the United States Army. In addition to his military service, he also was was a senior analyst for the Northrop Grumman Corporation and a radio on-air personality and station manager, so he knows this side of the microphone for sure. He also worked as a senior Department of Defense civilian for the U.S. Army Special Operations command and on and on he's also the owner of drayton communications he's a corporate speaker life coach etc etc uh, not diminishing that but uh, we're very excited to have him here matthew how are you my friend hey warner i'm very good and how are you and i'm glad you have me on today yeah uh it may seem terribly obvious but let's uh let's talk to you why uh why the book and why the title and why the subject matter well uh i i, I wrote the book Uh, After working with at-risk youth, I've been working with at-risk youth since uh, around the 2006 time frame, so almost 10 years. And I saw a lot of behaviors and a lot of things uh, happening with uh, young men today that I wanted to address. And the book gave me an opportunity to do that. Uh, The title, Succeeding While Black, I just took something that seems to always have a negative connotation with it. The phrase while black, usually when you hear it, it's driving, working, or dining while black, but it's always something negative. So I thought, hey, I'll put succeeding in front of it and uh, try to put a positive spin on it. Uh, But um, I'm I'm very happy with with the book. I I think that uh, the messages in there can be very helpful to anyone. Uh, It's a lot of old-fashioned things in there, uh, kind of back to our roots type things. Uh, things that the country was built on. One of the things that I, I want to get back to the book, but one of the things I noticed when when learning a little bit more about you is you pretty much made a decision on your own. Where I am right now as a young man uh, may not be a good spot for me for the long term, and you took it on yourself to leave. Was that a tough decision? It, it was a very it was a very tough decision, and I, and I'll tell you uh, I'll, I'll, a little truth in lending. I kind of wandered into that recruiter's office. You know, I, I think a lot of times our uh, destiny is, is, is already passed and already laid out for us. We're just uh, living through it. But I kind of walked in that recruiter's office. I didn't plan that out too well. <laughs> and I'll tell you, if you want to, if you walk into a recruiter's office without a plan, he'll he'll definitely take care of you. But uh, but I did know that I had to do something better than what I was doing, which was uh, getting into a lot of trouble. And I could see clearly that I was uh, heading down the wrong path. And I had a lot of people telling me so, to include my father. And so I decided to leave and and go into the military. And I will tell you, Warner, it's the best decision that I ever made. And your father had some challenges himself, did he not? He he had a lot of challenges. My father was a janitor. Uh, My mother died when I was seven years old. And my father was a a janitor, and he drank very heavily. Uh, As a matter of fact, I, I just say he... He was probably an alcoholic. You didn't, they didn't really diagnose things back then, you know. You, you just, but he drank yeah. very heavily. My wife, my mother's death took a big toll on him, and so he struggled trying to raise me. And I gave him a lot of problems. I was no uh, model child for him to raise, and so he had to work full time, try to take care of me. And then try to deal with all the other demons that he was dealing with. So it was not very easy for any of us. Did, did you have brothers and sisters, Matthew? I was an only child. So okay. that probably made it a lot worse because it depends on sometimes when you have siblings, you kind of tend to walk a little better straight and narrow path because you've got to either look out for them or they've got to look out for you. And tell us, uh, again, as sort of not a, at-risk use, but I guess that's what we would call it today, uh, you you joined the military, and tell us uh, about how you adapted to that and how that began to really shape you. Well, I'll tell you, one initially not very well. It's, it's, I don't know if you ever spent any time in, but usually your first introduction into the military is uh, almost like 
shock and all. Yeah. You're, you, <laughs> you're, they're yelling at you and making you do a bunch of push-ups. And so I did not like it initially. And, and I tell you, I struggled with it early on. I, and as a matter of fact, I did not think I would make it a career. But as time went on, I started to understand what they were saying to me. A lot of the things that we were doing and the way we were doing them made a lot of sense. And so I decided to stay, you know, 26 years later. But but I had a lot of great people that I met throughout my uh, 26-year career, a lot of, of, of great officers and NCOs that molded me and showed me what to do. I got the opportunity to travel all over the world and see how other people, other countries, and other cultures live. And I, and I will tell you, that will bring anybody back because we've got the greatest country in the world. There are a lot of complaining here. And everything's not perfect here, but I tell you what, the people that are doing that, they don't want to live anywhere else. So all of those things kind of got me on the right path. And uh, after that, once I started, uh, you know, advancing in the military and, and got close towards retirement, I decided that, hey, I needed to help uh, some other people uh, and try to give something back. If you just joined us again, uh, we're talking to Matthew R. Drayton. Uh, he has been mentoring at-risk youth for quite some time. He's currently the executive director uh, of the Great Oak Youth Development Center in North Carolina. He's also spent a couple of decades in the military, uh, private business. He's also a corporate and inspirational speaker. Brand new work called Succeeding While Black, a Blueprint for Success. I- I'm curious, uh, we all remember Watts, we remember Detroit, we remember a lot of the cities that burned in the late 60s and early 70s. I'm curious as to what you were thinking when you watched recently the events in Ferguson, Missouri, and in Baltimore. What was going through your head? Well, I I tell you, uh, both cases, uh, tragic cases of young people dying, uh, the first thing I thought about was we've got to find a way to prevent these things from happening. And when I say prevent it from happening, I'm not talking about picking a side and, and, and deciding who's right and who's wrong here. I I don't have all the information in either one of those cases. Uh, But I will tell you that we've got to find a way to, on both sides, to come to the table and talk, to have a better understanding of where each is coming from, and to have some, uh, swallow our pride, show some passion, show some compassion and some tolerance. Uh, The other thing I thought about when I saw the rioting and and the things that were going on there, I, I... I thought about Dr. King and how he would have handled this situation. And when I think of protests and I think of peaceful protests, I think of Dr. King. And I think we need to educate our children about that. Uh, You know, he changed. When I look at the the civil rights movement and I look at what's going on with the police, they're similar in some ways. But the civil rights movement, was, in my opinion, was a much bigger struggle. And that was handled with peaceful protests. So if that's the case, I think we can turn this thing around with police officers with peaceful protests as well. Let's go by. Let's jump back also to your career. We were talking about in the military. How uh, in the military did it matter whether you're black, white, brown, red, yellow, ever? It did not because I tell you, you you are forced in the military to live with other people. You you have no choice. You know, I'll tell you a quick story of. I, when I joined basic training, we were in a open base, and this was back in the old World War II barracks. This was in the uh, late 70s when I joined. And there was a, a kid, his last name was Dill. He would sit on his footlocker and just look at me. And what I, what I found out was Dill had never been around any African Americans his whole life. I mean, he, he was almost mesmerized by me, you know. And But I took the time to talk to him, and, and, and he kind of got to know me, and we talked a little bit about he was from a, a, a up in the a country part of North Carolina, like in the mountains, and he just had never been around any uh, uh, any black people. But that was an instance where but we were forced to be together. And, if, and had he not joined the military, he likely would have not. But back to your original question, you, color exists everywhere, and, and I, I'm sure there are times when you will experience uh, people, some racism or some indifference to your race. But in the military, for the larger part, that is put aside because you've got a mission to do and lives depend on it. How, uh, and so again, you were in the service for uh, almost three decades. What, uh, any particular reason you got out? Were you just kind of ready to be done? 
Well, I, I, I retired. My body started to break down. Uh, one, yeah. So I jumped out of airplanes for 20 years almost. <laughs> yeah. Which, and then don't ask me why I did that. Yeah. One, I, I won't be able to tell you. I got, it was all macho, but it, I'm paying the price now with my knees and everything else. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I was jumping out of airplanes. I was a sergeant major with 26 years in, which, you know, a sergeant major can stay for 30. So I could have stayed four more years. But I did not want to be on active duty and not be physically capable of keeping up and, and leading from the front. And that was a big decision. And my wife did not like that decision at all. She was not very happy when I told her I was going to drop my retirement papers. But, you know, I felt like if I'm going to stay in, I don't want to just be in drawing a paycheck. I want to be able to continue to jump, run, and do all the things the young men were doing. But my body was telling me something different. Well, in the book, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of those themes. They they may feel a little bit obvious from the title, but uh, give us some some headlines. What you think are one or two big lessons out of this book and big big pieces of guidance. So, one of the, the big ones I talk about is uh, education, and and that to me is kind of the paramount thing for young people today, especially because. If you get an education, you can improve your situation. If you get an education, you can get a way out of a bad situation. So I tell young people, stay in school and, and take school seriously. You know, I was talking to some people this morning. A lot of young people today, that school is just a place to go socialize. But we've got to get back to that. The other thing I think in, in, this, in the book, and I talk about this throughout, is accountability. You've got to hold yourself accountable first before you can hold anybody else accountable. And by that, I mean you've got to do what's right. It's not easy, and we'll all make mistakes. But if you're holding yourself accountable, uh, more than likely you will be on the right path uh, to success. And then I talk about uh, having a good attitude. Uh, Nobody wants to deal with anyone that has a bad attitude. And then uh, the other thing that I think is very, very important, the last thing I'll mention, is uh, surrounding yourself with good people. You know, my father used to say, if you hang out with two bums, you will become the third. And I, I'll never forget him saying that. And there were times when I could see myself sliding into that because you're going to be a product of the environment you hang around. What about, uh, and again, this whole thing of self-responsibility and, and trying to debunk that myth that I came from a tough environment, so hence I will forever uh, be in challenging situations. I, 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 I disagree with that wholeheartedly because I am a product of one of those environments, and uh, I put in a lot of work to get out of, those, of that environment. And everybody has that opportunity because everybody has the opportunity to get an education. We've got libraries. We've got a lot of free resources out there with, that can teach us and, and, and improve us. Uh, we have the opportunity to work. And, you know, one of the things that I want to clear up, too, about success, you know, success does not necessarily always mean being wealthy, rich, and famous. I, I, I've been very blessed to be able to accomplish a lot, but there are a lot of people who are out going to work every day, supporting their families, uh, being productive members of society that are successful, just as successful as I am. Uh, by the way, the dictionary, uh, the definition of success in the dictionary is a favorable outcome. So it's not wealth, fame, and, and fortune. It's just something, I got it. What about, uh, I, I know from your own experiences, you you feel like you want to share five ways to avoid altercations with the police, and that's not directly really what what this particular book is all about, but share those with us anyway. Yeah, I'll share those with you. And what, what that came from, uh, Warner, was an article I wrote that got a lot of, of uh, I wrote the article a, a little over a month ago, but when the things broke in Baltimore and some of the other places, uh, it got picked up and, and, and got a lot of uh, traction on it. But, uh, yeah, I talk about avoiding altercations with the police. And, and let me just start by saying, Warner, that I have been pulled over by police more times than I can count. But I have never been uh, uh, physically assaulted by the police. I have been verbally abused by them. I have been talked to in very demeaning ways. However, I've never been beaten or struck by a police officer, and I think the reason I have not is because of the way I conducted myself. It takes two people to escalate something, and 
I am smart enough to know that if I'm in an altercation with the police, I am going to probably lose that battle. And I think a lot of our young men need to start thinking that way as well. So I talk about five things. I talk about obeying the law, which no brainer. So if you're breaking the law, you're going to have some type of uh, interaction with the police officer. But if you're breaking the law and he stops you, then there's other things you need to do. Be polite, show respect. And I'm, you don't have to uh, bow down to a police officer, but saying yes, sir, and, and, and being polite and courteous is only going to de-escalate the situation. You're not going to – it's very hard for somebody to be uh, mean and, and aggressive towards you if you're being nice and respectful to them. And then I talk about obeying what the police tells you to do. Um, stay in your car, put your hands where they, they can see them, and just give them. If you ask for your license, let them have your license. But one of the most important things I talk about uh, is educating your children. I think we need to teach our children, especially uh, young African-American males at an early age, how to deal with police officers if they're stopped once they start driving or if they encounter them in the streets, and just let them understand that police are not all bad. And the other thing I tell people with regards to uh, dealing with law enforcement, and I've got law enforcement uh, uh, members of my family, uh, some of my friends are law enforcement officers. Uh, those are people just like us. They just wear the uniform. That's their job. But a lot of times when things happen, we don't always have all the information. When when I, I've been pulled over on a couple of stops where my vehicle matched another vehicle. So I, I think we need to understand the police a little better. I think we need to specifically educate our children and make sure that they understand what to do, how to act, how to behave if they're pulled over or stopped by law enforcement. And then the big thing, make some lifestyle changes. And if you're, if you're hanging out with known criminals, known felons, hanging out in gang neighborhoods, hanging out in drug uh, dealing neighborhoods or places, not hanging out there, but hanging out with drug dealers, because I realize some people live in those neighborhoods, but if you're doing things that are going to draw the police attention towards you, you're going to have encounters with them. I'm curious as to the kind of reaction you're getting from the black community. And I say that with kind of a what really is the black community. But just what kind of reaction have you been getting uh, from those that you've directed the book towards? Uh, so I've been getting pretty good. Uh, uh, I've been getting pretty good. Uh, recept- My book has been pretty well received by most in the black community, because a lot of people think the same way I'm thinking. I think me as a black man saying some of the things I'm saying is a little more palatable towards some of them. I can honestly say that. But the bottom line, you know, I'll be honest with you, Warner. I'm not really uh, too concerned about reception. I'm more concerned about prevention, preventing these things from happening. And I know for a fact that if you pull over, do what the officers tell you, Nine times out of ten, you're going to be on your way. You know, you may get a ticket. I've been given tickets. I've been let go. And, and let's, let's all face it. When those blue lights come on behind you, it ruins your whole day. We all know that. It's, it, is, it is one of the worst feelings in the world when it happens to you. But it happens. And when it does, it, it's, it, it's something we have to learn to deal with in such a way to stop some of the deaths. Uh, the thing that happened in South Carolina was just a tragedy, a horrible accident. But that young man jumped out of his car and ran, and, and that officer reacted to that horribly and deserves to be where he is right now. But again, I, I, would we be talking about this if he stayed in his vehicle? And then, so these are the type of things that I'm, I'm more concerned about, and I'm, I'm not really, but I, have, but I will say this. I have had some people uh, say that I'm a police sympathizer, which is not the truth. I mean, I'm, I am not picking any side on this. I am trying to be someone who is trying to prevent these things from happening. What about, uh, I'm curious as to your work at the youth center. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Great Oak. Okay, well, so Great Oak Youth Development Centers, we were founded in 2006, and I have been there with them since that time, not in the position as executive director, but as a mentor and a donor and a contributor and volunteer. Uh, We work with at-risk youth, males, 6 to 18 years old. Uh, the majority of these boys we work with are African-American, but we work with anybody. So we, have, we will not turn away any child that comes uh, looking for our services as long as we can match them up 
with a mentor. We also have, we do one-on-one mentoring. We also do group mentoring. So we have some boys that come to some of the group events. Uh, we teach them about leadership, responsibility. Uh, we have summer camps. We have after-school programs. We do a thing called Men and Boys Unity where we have uh, judges, policemen, accountants, soldiers from the community come in and talk to them about success. And we've had a, a quite a, a, a good turnaround on several boys. We've had several success stories where we've seen young men come in with real nasty, mean dispositions. And in a few years, once they see someone cares about them and once they see a positive male role model or real role models in their lives, you see a big change in these kids. And some of them have gone on to uh, graduate from high school are in college now, some are in the military now, and some have graduated from high school and are working on their jobs. But, but so we've had some success, but it's a very good program, uh, and we're, we're, I'm very proud of Great Oak. We've done a lot of great things in the uh, Fayetteville community. Are you feeling with, uh, not only just with your travels around the country and the speaking that you do and, and meeting with people and also at Great Oak, are you feeling overall pretty hopeful about the future or uh tell us uh, have we come very far at all or we still got some pretty big struggles out there well i'll answer that in two parts uh, do i feel hopeful about the future warner yes i do because i'm an optimist i'm just that's just the way i'm wired do this to your second question yes i think we've come a long way but i still think we have a long way to go but again i'm going to go back to let's start looking at Individually, if, if, if every parent held themselves accountable and then held their kids accountable and then went to school and held their teachers accountable, we would immediately start seeing a turnaround. But what I see a lot of is people are just, nobody is involved, and, and so the kids are out there kind of on their own. And that's all our communities, not just the African-American community. So that a lot of kids are raising themselves. There it, it just seems to be a lack of parental involvement with the children than it was in my day. And so that's what I, I think we need. But I think we're, we've come a long way. I still think we have a long way to go in a lot of areas. But I, I will tell you, like I said before, and, and I've traveled all over the world, this is still the best place to live in, in the world. What about uh, this this whole idea, as you said, you feel like a lot of parents have kind of lost their way a little bit. What, what do you attribute that to? Well, I attribute it to uh, uh, single parents. Uh, is, is definitely rough. My father was a single parent, even though it was a little different. But uh, single parenting, for sure. You know, I've, I've, I am currently mentoring a uh, 15-year-old uh, boy who is a high school student, and his father's not in his life. And so that's so that's a that's a. I, I think kids need two parents. I, I truly believe that. I think they need to see that interaction between a man and a woman. I think they need to see how a family structures themselves, and, and I think they need to have, especially young men, they need to have a man in their lives after they reach a certain age to show them how to become a man. Well, it is a subject that uh, we very much appreciate. Matthew R. Drayton is uh, trying to tackle. The work is called Succeeding While Black, A Blueprint for Success. It is published by Drayton Communications. Uh Matthew, how can people find out a little bit more about the work that you do and also get a copy of the book? Uh, okay, so to find out a little bit more about uh, Great Oak Youth Development Center, you can go to our website at goydc.com. And to get copies of my book, you can go to barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. You can also find out a little bit more about me and my book on my website, mattdrayton.com. Well, I appreciate so much uh, the work that you do and your contributions, not only in the military, but also to the great work that you're doing with American youth and, and race relations in general, uh, and would love to have you back on again sometime. Juan, I would love to uh, be on your show again, and uh, I'd just like to close with, I saw a quote today on uh, Twitter, and it said that if you have made it to the top and you have been successful and achieved any success, it is your obligation to send the elevator back down to the to the bottom, to send the elevator back down. So I, I thought that was very poignant because I think a lot of times when we get to a certain point in our lives, we kind of forget that there are people that need help. So that is uh, uh, what I try to do 
uh, with my work. Well, well said. Thank you so much. And uh, again, thanks so much for being on with us. Hey, thanks a lot, Warner. I appreciate it. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.